Hi, uh, my name is Caleb Lons, and today we are going to just go over AP Calculus BC free response questions. So this is from the 2013 exam, and we're going to be going in depth on question three. If you're studying and you want the most out of this, get paper, get a pen or pencil, um, and, and solve the problem as we go through it. Um, I'm not going to just solve it myself and show you the answers. I'm going to lead us through the definitions, the theorems, things that are important um, in general knowledge for more than just this isolated free response question. Um, so take notes, solve along, you learn math by doing, um, and I hope this is helpful to some people. So let's just get right into it. So we are just, um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through all four of the parts, but I'm not, I don't want to just solve it. I want to explain how you could come up with the points, show you where the points are coming from. And so you know when you have to actually do these on your own, what's important to note, what maybe isn't important to note, et cetera, et cetera. So the best place to start with an FRQ is always by reading this STEM, but not reading the, don't worry about all the details because the STEM is going to include details that you'll pick from for the entire problem. So for, to save time, sometimes it's useful to kind of just skim the stem, get an idea of what's going on, and then go straight into the part A or whatever when you start. So we're given a table, and I see we have uh, in minutes and in ounces, some function in terms of ounces. Um, a hot water is dripping through a coffee maker, filling a large cup of coffee. An amount of coffee in the cup, a time, T, and then yada, they're giving us some domain of T is given by a differentiable, so this is going to be important, um, function C, um, where T is measured in minutes. Selected values of C, T are measured in ounces. So we're just given some values. So take away from the stem, just real quick in the back of your mind, is that C is just a function. It, it's just simply telling you a quantity of coffee in a cup. It's not anything tricky. It's no rate or anything like that. Um, part A wants us to use this data uh, to approximate C prime of 3.5. Then they always kind of say something stupid like, you know, show your computations that lead to your answer. And important, indicate unit to measure. I cannot tell you how many times people lose points because they just don't include unit to measure. So always include that. Um, what this is playing off of, you might think, okay, well, 3.5 there's no data point for that. We only have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So how are we going to get that? Well, this is going to play off of a concept um, from your derivatives, and that's the average rate of change. An average rate of change of a function. This is an extremely important um, idea. Average rate of change of a function essentially states um, for some function, if you have a function f, then f of b minus f of a divided by b minus a. This is what we call the average rate of change of f, so specifically of the function f, um, on the interval, and then a to B. So if you have if you have A and B as kind of his bounds, then the average rate of change is going to be this the function value at B minus the function value of A over B minus A. And this is often used as an approximation for a derivative. Okay. So if we keep this in the back of our minds, let's stick that over here for now. So it's kind of out of the way. If we talk about this, we're trying to approximate a rate of change. Notice that C prime, whenever you see that prime, that means it's a rate of change of C, regardless of what C is. In this case, C is our function C of T. So we're really asking about how it's changing at 3.5, T equals 3.5 minutes. And it's an approximation because we're gonna be leveraging this average rate of change concept. So we know we can approximate the rate of change at 3.5 using the average 
rate of change. That's what they're trying to test here. Whenever you see any question that looks like use data in any table to approximate any derivative at any point, you are going to use this. College Board copies and pastes this kind of problem in a lot of their free response questions. So just memorize that. If you see this, there, this is what they want you to do, and this is how you're going to get the point. So this is going to be approximately, because it's not quite equals. Um, and then we look, 3.5. How can we conveniently bound that? So 3.5 is smack dab in the middle of um, that. Well, we noticed that 3.5 would fall right in between 3 and 4 right here. So let's just let the A be the 3 and the B be the 4. So in this case, our C of B, right, the function value at the B value, the B value we've chosen to be 4, so 4. And then the function value, which happens to be C. And then A is just 3 in this case. Once again, we're seeing that 3.5 is exactly midway between this 3 and the 4. And then we just finish up the formula. 4 minus 3. And the rest is simple arithmetic, right? We just plug in what we get. C of 4 is 12.8. And C of 3 is 11.2. And then we're dividing by 1, which is really handy. We don't have to do anything funny. So this is just going to turn out to be um, 1.6. And don't stop, because there are units of measure, always. And they give these to you in the um, oops, problem stem. It's quite literally just take this unit and put it over this unit. Here's where notation can come into play if you forget how to do the units. Um, C prime of T is really just a way of rewriting DC with respect to T. So the function was change of the fun of C with respect to time. And you literally notice that what are the units of C? Well, ounces. And what are the units of time? Minutes. And that's literally how you can come up with those units with, if you're not sure what to do. So the answer would be um, 1.6 ounces per minute. What you shouldn't be afraid of is college board graders um, docking you points for representing it like this, okay? If you said ounces per minute, that's just totally as acceptable as if you did ounces per minute, as long as you're communicating um, the proper, accurate mathematical idea. Doesn't matter if you spell it out like I did with the word per or use the fraction bar, that's not a big deal. What is a big deal is getting the actual <laughs> types of units correct. Okay, so, this went in the, the way it's graded, where points are awarded, you will get a point for just getting this correct number. But then the other point, you get a whole point just for identifying these correct units. So never forget that um, after you find a numerical answer. Okay, so we're going to move on to part B. Okay, so part B, I've cleared the board so it's not just a Disgusting mess of stuff all over. Um, if you need to go back and pause and rewrite, that's totally fine. So in part B here, um, it asks, okay, so is there a time t within these bounds, right? So 2 is less than or equal to t, and that's less than or equal to 4, at which c prime of t, or just the derivative of t, equals 2, and then justify your answer, right? Which means you can't just pop down an answer. You can't just say yes. <laughs> or no. Um, this is a classic example of a free response question type that they ask testing the mean value theorem. Can you recognize when you need to use the mean value theorem? And before we get to that, let's talk about what the mean value theorem is, and then how, if you know what it is going into this kind of a question, you would see which elements are being hinted at in this question part. Um, question part that would signal you to use that. So the mean value theorem, the mean value theorem. And this is going to say, basically, if, and whenever there's an if statement, that's extremely important. That, that means it's going to come up. Those are conditionals. If these conditions are met, they have to be met. 
So if if what's going on, we need f some function to be continuous. So is continuous on any given interval, closed bounds note, and differentiable. Differentiable on the open bound. So notice the difference between brackets and parentheses. Um, then there, are, there exists a number C on this interval, on the um, open interval, A comma B, such that the following mathematical statement is true. So you have some f prime to the derivative at that c value in this interval is going to equal f of b minus f of a over b minus a. If you're paying attention in part a, you'll notice that this is really beautiful, right? The mean value theorem is connecting the average rate of change here with this idea of a derivative. Okay, so your derivative at some point t, which is just the slope, is going to at some point equal the average rate of change. And I think since the purpose of this is to be more instructional, I'm going to show a very beautiful insight that can make this possibly and potentially much more intuitive. So suppose we have some example um, sample curve. This doesn't have to be anything exact. We just have a curve on A to B. So from A to B. And this curve is F, right? So this is going to be Y equals F of X. Now, if we wanted to, what, this is what the mean value theorem says, okay? So if we have the average rate of change, I'm gonna do that in blue. The average rate of change will be taking the function value at A, the function value at B, and then essentially the slope between them. So we would get this slope. Now, the mean value theorem says, okay, we're going to guarantee that at least once, there's gonna be at least one point on this curve so that you'll have the same exact slope, essentially a parallel slope to the average rate of change here in blue. So what I'm gonna show in red are these points. And we can identify that right about here, approximately right here, say for example, that is a location in which the slope of the tangent is, rough, is parallel with the average rate of change. And in this very specific curve, like I just kind of arbitrarily squiggled something on the board. Um, we actually have a second point where this is true and you think, can you spot where this is gonna be? It's gonna be up roughly around here because the slope at the curve at that point is roughly, I didn't draw that very well, but there we go, is roughly parallel to this. And so, this is the graphical, uh, a, a fun way to visualize this. And actually in the future, there are FRQs that ask questions that involve this kind of visual analysis. Um, and that's what the mean value theorem is. This will always happen. As so long as the conditions, right? F is continuous, that's definitely true. It's, diff it's differentiable, that's also definitely true. Then there exists a number C. That does not mean there is only one. That just means there has to be at least one value C in this interval. And so like this number right here, we could say that this is occurring at some X equals uh, C. And this is some, you know, C sub one, this could be a C sub two, um, such that the slope at this specific point, right? The slope F prime of C sub one, is the same thing as the average rate of change, the average rate of change slope, f of b minus f of a over b minus a. 
And so I know I just spent a lot of time going over that, um, but I feel like it's extremely important, not just for this problem, but because College Board really asks a lot of free response questions based off of this. And so knowing it now, it'll help us answer this question, know what to look for, but also in uh, future problems, that is definitely useful that will come up. So how do we identify that this is even a mean value theorem problem, right? That's a good question to ask. Once you're familiar with the mean value theorem, you know it really well, how do you identify it? Well, they're asking us for a time t, okay, so some time. We're given some bounds here. We're given an a equals two, a b equals four kind of thing going on here. Um, we're asked for a certain derivative at this time t being some number, okay? So this is going to call for what we want to do is verify that if we take the average rate of change using these numbers, we get that number two, all right? So that's how we can recognize that the mean value theorem is at play here. And in future problems, very similar clues. You'll be given some, some parameter, the independent variable, within certain constraints, the bounds, and then the derivative of the function equals some number, and then you want to verify and make a little mini proof. So how do we go about this? So what we can recognize is that, once again, what were those conditions, those super important conditions for the mean value theorem? F has to be continuous on the closed interval and differentiable on the open interval, and we can show that. Because in the problem stem, don't forget they gave us this, C is differentiable. And a little fact that you need to know in general for just calculus is that if a function is differentiable, that implies that that function is continuous. Now don't get it confused. If it's differentiable, or sorry, if it's continuous, that does not imply it's differentiable. But if it's differentiable, that implies it's continuous. So if it's if it differentiable, That implies it's continuous. And if it's continuous, does not imply that it's differentiable. And so what College Board, what a grader needs to see so that they can give you credit for this point is for you to just simply literally just state that. All you have to do is write down in English and state it. Show the grader what you know. So we can say that C of T is differentiable on, oh, sorry about that. We can't get that today. Uh, is differentiable. On. And so if it's differentiable from 0 to 6, it has to be differentiable on 2 to 4 because that's within the interval. So on 2 to 4. And so if it's differentiable, that implies it's continuous. So C of T is continuous on the closed interval 2 to 4. And great, now we just need to double check the average rate of change, right? So the average rate of change is going to be C of the B value, which is four in this case, minus C of the A value, which is two in this case, and pulling that from here, over B minus A. Just go straight back to the table, 12.8 minus 8.8. .8. divided by two. And well, 12.8 minus 8.8 .8 is just four. And then four divided by two, that's just two. And so look at that. We just showed that um, C prime of T, there's some point C prime of T equals the average rate of change, and that equals two. And that's exactly what it says here. And so we could say, Yes, um, there is a time t 
on 2 less than t less than 4 um, at which c prime of t equals 2. And then why? Essentially, we state that because C of T is differentiable on, and you would spell it out, but I don't want to waste your time, on the open interval. And so you could do that by just simply using the parentheses notation. And continuous on the closed interval. And C prime, oops, not that one average rate of change. So this C4 minus C2 over 4 minus 2 equals 2. And then don't forget, don't ever forget to mention the theorem. So I, the mean value theorem. And so where do you get your points from? You're getting a point for making this computation right here, showing this and you're getting a point for all of this. So stating this, stating this, combining it with this, and then finally stating the theorem. That all is the last point. So those are all important. Um, and I know that this feels like a lot. <laughs> I mean, it kind of is, but it's the background knowledge that you would practice and develop. In the actual, um, if you're when you're actually taking this test, say under timed conditions, you're not doing all of that extra stuff in the background, right? You're just immediately recognizing, okay, I need to compute the average rate of change. Okay, I did that. I showed it was two. Now I just need to do the laundry list. State that it's differentiable on the open interval. State that it's continuous on the closed interval. And then state that the average rate of change equals whatever value I'm trying to check it with. Boom, you know, mean value theorem, we're done. We got the points and then we move on, okay? All right, so now we can move on to part C. Okay, so board square again, part C. What we've got going on here, the predominant thing is going to be midpoint sum. Uh, use a midpoint sum with three subintervals of equal length indicated by the data in the table uh, to approximate this, whatever this is. And then using correct units, once again, explain the meaning of that, whatever we just figured out, okay? so. I'm going to assume you have, if you're studying for this FRQ, you have had the lesson that goes over Riemann sum. So I'm not gonna reteach that entire lesson. Um, what I'm going to do is just be thorough and show how you could use a table like this um, to do a Riemann sum, because you're not given an actual function that you can plug in, you know, give values from. You're given a table of values, but it functions <laughs> the same way. So one sixth, zero to six of our function C of T dt. So we're integrating this, which is great. So we're approximating it. All right, what's going on? So first of all, midpoint Riemann sum, and we have three subintervals. So when I see that we're doing the three subintervals, I like to visualize what this is going to entail. Um, and that entails the leftmost point of this rectangle in the x direction and the rightmost um, point in the x direction. And so I know that I'm going to have some rectangle here that's going to go from 0 to 2. And it's going to have, you know, some midpoint height, because this is the middle. If 0, if the 0 is the left, and if this is the right, then this has to be the middle, right? So it has some height here. And then we just got to do that again. So the idea is and this is going to be a little bit in the way. Oof, well, sorry to the table, I kind of messed it up. But the next set is that now this two here is going to be the left. This is going to be the new middle and this is going to be the new right. So see what happened there? And so once again, we're going to have a rectangle that has a 
base of two, and the midpoint is going to be a little bit taller. So something like this. And then finally, if you think about it, this becomes the new left. This becomes the new middle. This becomes the new right. So you have three equal, you have three subintervals. The one that goes from zero to two, two to four, and four to six. Those are all equally sized. And we've been pulling the midpoints, which have been one, three, and five. And so I'll just illustrate this one real quick. It'll be a little bit taller. Okay, so this is generally where we're getting these numbers from. So when we talk about this, all we need to do is show that we understand Riemann sums. So we take the two minus zero, because that's the difference, that's the x, that's the width, this difference between this one and this one. And in this case, we are multiplying it with the function value just in the midpoint, so one, c of one. Next one. Uh, the next, remember, so this was going from here to here was our first subinterval, and the next subinterval, this is the left endpoint, and this is the right endpoint. So, we are taking four minus two, and then taking the midpoint in between that. So in between four and two is three. And then finally, this is like up here. This is the left end, this is the right end. So we want to get the, the width of the, the base. Once again, these are represented, this two, this two, and this two. So six minus four, and then the function value in the middle, which is this five right here. The rest of that problem is just going to be plugging and chugging, right? So we have one sixth, two times c of one, which is 5.3, two times, and then c of three is 11.2, six minus four is two, c of five is 13.8. And those are just grabbing from the table. And you can do a little bit of, you can, speed this up. If you pull the two out, you can get one third because two six is one third. And then sum up 5.3 plus 11.2 plus 13.8, that's going to be 30.3. And then when you just simplify that, it's 10.1. Now, we don't want to forget the units because, oh man, that it's sad to miss the units on a problem like this. Um, it's easy to forget, too, because you've done all this streamlined stuff. So using correct units, what is it? So we just are talking about an average rate of change, or not, sorry, not average rate of change, the average value of a function. And since the function is in ounces, this is just going to be in ounces. Okay, so the, um, the back half of this part, right, using correct units, explain the meaning of this integral. This requires you recognize a very important definition. Uh, the definition of the average value of a function. So the average value of a function, any function f on the interval from a to B is this. It's going to be um, 1 divided by B minus A times the integral from A to B of your function. Notice that this is exactly what we have going on here. We have some sort of 1 over a B minus A from A to B in the problem. So let me move this, just delete that. Notice that if we have one over six minus zero from zero to six of C of T DT, this is an average value. So that's all you have to do. You just have to identify that. And then all you have to do is simply write down in English what's going on. We can say, um, 
1 over 6 from 0 to 6 CFT is the average. Um, and in this case, what is the function? We're talking about the amount of coffee, okay? So this is the average amount of coffee in the cup. Average amount of coffee in the cup on the interval. And it's a time interval. The time interval zero to six minutes. Don't forget the units there. <laughs> State what time units you're doing. And that's all. So where are you getting your points from? You're getting your point, you're getting actually three points here. So you're gonna get a point for this essentially. Can you do Riemann sums? Can you show how you built that? Um, and then you actually get a point for actually, you know, properly calculating what that is gonna be. And then the last point is this interpretation. So stating, recognizing that this is average amount of the function. So amount of coffee in the cup, and then make sure you state the time interval because the interval comes with this average amount. That's part of the definitions, part of the concept. So that's where you get that third point from. Okay, so now on to the final part, D. Okay, so part D is the last part in this problem. And let's see, we want, okay, so we know that we're being told some new information here. The amount of coffee in the cup in ounces is modeled by B of T equals this. Using the model, find the rate at which the amount of coffee in the cup is changing at t equals five. Okay, lots of words, but just pick this apart. Using, when they say this model, it's just referring to b of t. Find the rate, that's a key word, rate at which the amount of coffee in the cup is changing. So this is kind of how you can dissect this very, very quickly. When you see the words amount of coffee, in the cup, just associate that with B of T. That's a terrible B. Let me try that again. B <laughs> of T. Now, whenever you deal with a rate, always associate that with a derivative, okay? So rate associate with derivative. Okay, so this is what should be going on in your mind. You don't have to handwrite all this out, by the way. Just that's what should be kind of going in the background. So what you notice here is that, um, let's see, find the rate at which the amount of coffee in the cup. Well, we just said the amount of coffee in the cup is just B of T. So rate of B of T, so derivative of B of T, B prime of T is changing at T equals five, at T equals five. So there you go. That's how you would dissect the all this English into just what you're really looking for. You're looking for B prime of T, and then plug in five, get an answer. So that's gonna be our process. That's gonna be the general strategy um, here. You'll notice that we're dealing with um, an exponential, something very simple. So we just take B of T, which is 16 minus 16 E to the negative 0 0.4 T. And when we take the derivative, right? The derivative e prime of t, the constant, so 16 is just gonna go away. We have the minus 16, the e to the negative 0 0.4 t, because e is the derivative of itself. But we, we can't forget the chain rule, right? We need to multiply by the derivative of what's up in here. And the derivative of negative 0 0.4 t with respect to t is just negative 0.4. Very easy. Um, we gotta combine um, this idea right here. Um, and since we're not, this is a no calculator problem, so I'm just going to quickly um, do this arithmetic. <laughs> and oftentimes arithmetic is the hardest part of the example. So um, 4 tenths is just 2 fifths. And notice that I'm doing it in terms of positive because I know that these negatives are going to cancel out. So we're really taking 16 times 2 fifths, which is 32 fifths. 
So B prime of T equals positive 32 fifths times E to the negative 0.4 T. Okay, great. So now we just got to plug in five and we are golden. B prime of five equals 32 over five e to that negative 0 0.4 multiplied by five. And so note that four tenths is just two fifths. So if we were to take that 0 0.4 and it's a negative 0 0.4 and we multiply it with five, that just gives us minus two. Okay, so b prime of five is 32 over five e to the minus two. And if you, I mean, you could leave it there. Any grader has to give you the answer, though the point for that answer. If you really wanted to be clean, you could do that. <laughs> but it doesn't matter. You could, you could stop here, save some time, move on to the next question, and that totally gets the point. So where are the points falling? Um, you're actually getting a point for just correctly evaluating and finding this expression for the derivative, which makes sense. And then obviously you get a point for correctly substituting in and getting the um, answer. I almost made a big mistake here, and what am I going to say? We, for, we forgot the units, all right? So we're dealing with a rate. What, even though we're talking about B, we're still talking about the rate in which um, the amount of coffee is changing, which is essentially just saying how many ounces per minute. And so this is the correct answer. If you didn't have these units, you don't get this point. Um, but it, so make sure you include those units in, in this problem as well. All right, so much more straightforward part. That is all of the parts of question three. Um, I am just realizing now that the, this was a little longer than I expected it was gonna be, but it's good. Um, we covered a lot of great things. We covered the average rate of change of a function, that definition, which is extremely important just in general for the exam and FRQs. Uh, we were able to cover the mean value theorem, once again, extremely important. There's conceptual questions and MCQs and other ones in FRQs um, that come up quite often. We were able to show how the definition of the average value of a function, which relates to integration, can play a part in these kind of FRQ no calculator kind of type problems. Um, and then lastly, just a very simple taking a derivative and plug and jug. So um, that is all I have for you today. Have and good luck studying.